Hi, my name is Rob Bentz. I'm an instructor here in the computer networking program at Dunwoody College of Technology. Today we're going to talk about uh, the subnetting of an IP address, specifically an IPv4 address. And to start out the process a little bit, we're going to break into a little bit of the basics of the IP address itself and some of the rules behind it. Uh, before you can actually break it down and do the subnetting process, we need to learn a little uh, background information in order to do the mathematics to understand the subnetting process. So, to begin, the IPv4 address space is a 32-bit space. It contains two pieces of information. These two pieces of information are decided by uh, what's known as a subnet mask. Those two pieces of information are called a host ID and a network ID. And again, it's the subnet mask that determines what part of each of the address that is. The format of an IP address looks very much like what I have on the, on the board here, uh, 192.168.1.1. That's known as a dotted decimal format. And that's what we as humans see when we're configuring these things, the dotted decimal format. However, the computer looks at it a little bit differently. They see it at the binary level. And they also operate on these at the binary level. So we're going to take a look at this from the binary level to gain an understanding of how our computers and our routers and all of the network, networking gear that's out there um, determines what network it belongs to logically. To determine the host ID and the net ID, um, our, user our, our computers use a process called ANDing. And it's a Boolean math idea, and the Boolean math idea relates all the way around all of the binary concepts where we only have ones and zeros. So it's not the same as uh, putting a couple of numbers that we're normally used to putting together, like 2 plus 2 equals 4. Uh, we've got some different rules here. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of this process here of what the ANDing process looks like, and it's built from um, an AND gate logic circuit, and um, it looks a little bit like this. So if we were to look at an AND gate here real briefly, this is what a electronic diagram of an AND gate looks like roughly. And they take in signals here on the inputs and they have an output. And the rules behind this are um, if we give these inputs labels, we can uh, assign ones and zeros for those inputs and take a look at what the output would look like. So um, we draw what's called a, a truth table. And it looks like this. We have our two inputs, X and Y, right here. And then the output over here is Z. And if I place a zero and a zero on these two inputs, that's these right here, my output on an AND gate is zero. Okay, so. We just keep moving through here. If you know how to count by binary, that's what this is going to look like. We've got 0, 0, and then 0, 1, and 1, 0, and 1, 1. And we're just going to look at all of those different setups on the AND gate and what their output is. So if I place a 1 here on the Y output, or I'm sorry, the Y input, the AND gate treats it just like this first piece, 0 and 0, you get a 0 out. So again, we get a 0 out on the Z output there. So 0 and 1 always ends up as being a, a 0 on an AND gate. In fact, the real rule behind a AND gate is you need both inputs to be a 1 to get a 1 out. That's the idea of ANDing. We're trying to see if this signal and this signal are on to get an output. That's a uh, the signaling output there. So really the truth table comes down to the only place that we get a 1 out of an AND gate is we have two inputs as a 1. Now all of this sets up what some of our computer systems are using to, to determine what part of an IP address, that 32-bit space, is a network ID and a host ID. Okay, so Taking all this away, we're going to look at all of the binary numbers um, as a whole. Instead of just one individual piece, we're going to take the entire IP address at its binary level and bring in the subnet mask 
to show how the computer will use the mask and the IP address together to come up with what network it belongs to. So on the board here, I have the 192.168.1.1 IP address. In its full 32-bit format in binary, it looks like this. And if we bring in a subnet mask, the classic mask for this address space is 255.255.255.0. If we bring that in in addition to this and look at the anding process, we can see how the computer determines what network it belongs to. So I'm going to convert all of these 255s. I've already got the 192 and 16811 figured out here. I'm just going to bring in the 255 underneath. And then these are zeros. So what our computer does is that anding process. And we and each one of these individually, and we can see what ends up being the network ID, and it masks off the host portion, so we can identify the, the logical network that the computer belongs to. So you just simply go through it, and again, those rules with the AND gate. You need a 1 and a 1 to get a 1. So when you look at this, 1 and 1, the result here, 1. 1 and 1, 1. 0 and 1 results in a 0, and again and again, and again, and again, and again. Moving on down the line, we got a 1 and a 1. That's a 1, 0 and 1. And I'm just going to finish all of this off here. And what we should see is that anything that the subnet mass comes up against with a 1 up here, it just kind of falls through the, uh, the filtering mechanism here, or the anding process. And anywhere we have a zero in the mask, that gets clipped off. So you'll see that here in a second when I get out here. And out on the last bit of this 32-bit space, that gets masked off. So what ends up happening when we take all of this binary and convert it back to decimal, you'll see that the network ID for this particular host that we're looking at at 192.168.1.1 is 192.168.1.0. And the, the mask here that I wrote down is 255.255.255.0. This is known as a network ID. Now, the different IP networks that are out there were broken up originally into classes of addresses. We have a class A address, a class B address, and a class C address. Each one of those class uh, ranges have a different uh, prescribed fixed mask that goes with it. So if we were to look at the class A range, it starts at 1.0.0.0 and runs all the way up to 126.255.255.255. That space has a fixed uh, mask of 255.0.0.0. And we can only play with the last three uh, portions of that IP address. Each one of those dotted decimal portions are known as an octet because they contain eight bits. So that first portion, that first piece of the subnet mask, the first 255 and then the rest are zeros, that first 255 is 8 bits. Now the next class, the class B space, um, then picks up a, a, a little bit farther ahead. We have a reserved space of 127.0.0.1, really uh, is the most common, but it's the entire set there that's reserved for a loopback address. So you see the class A range go all the way up to the 126.255.255.255 and then it looks like it skips one but it's really just a reserved space and we go right up to 128.0.0.0 for the class B space and then the class B range will run all the way up to 191.255.255.255 and that one that class B range has a uh, fixed 
subnet mask of 255.255.0.0. Now, we keep going with the class C address space, and that one picks up at 192.0.0, and that one will run all the way up to 223.255.255.255.0. Three 255s and one zero on the end there. Now, there's a couple of other ranges. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the class C range there has a uh, pre-fixed um, subnet mask, of course, of 255.255.255.0. And those three ranges, the class A, the class B, and the class C range, um, have a fixed mask that goes with those. There are a couple of other ranges in there that don't have an IP address because they're not used to assign IP addresses to hosts or routers or printers or anything like that. The class D range is used for multicasting. That's uh, the 224.0.0.0 .0 .0 .0 up to 239.255.255.255. 255. Um, that's used for multicasting. And then we have another range, which is the last little slice of that 32-bit space, starting at 240 and goes all the way up to 255 there. Um, that was reserved for uh, expansion or experimental use. And, uh, well, the experiments and all of that stuff led us to IPv6. So we're not even using that space at all. Now, the common notation that you'll see um, is CIDR notation. And what it looks like real briefly for all of those class ranges, I'll write down here. We have, if we were to look at a class A address, the CIDR notation will just put a slash on the end of that and how many bits the mask is. So a slash 8 is really a 255.0.0.0 mask. And they do that all the way up. So to give an example at the um, class B range, 172.16.1.1, for example, that would be a slash 16. That mask is 255.255.0.0. .255 .255 now again, this 8 and this 16 here are just simply identifying how many bits of the mask are on. So we've got 8 bits on. Again, octets here, we have all 8 bits on, that makes it 255. Same thing here, 16, got 16 bits on, but we break that up into dotted decimal. These octets turn those into 8, or into eight on bits, which is 255. And then again, the class C range, a 192 space here which is the example that we did earlier, would look like slash 24. And that one is the 255.255.255.0. So that's what they all look like there. Um, and that's the basics of the, uh, the IP address space that you need to know before we can even take anything apart. Uh, in the next segment, we're going to take a look at those pieces that were kind of fixed and looked like they couldn't be played around with, and we're going to break them apart a little bit and turn some of the host portion stuff into network portion stuff.